This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the importance of uh, experiments, especially field experiments, for micro foundations for the socioeconomic uh, sci sciences. Um, uh, Falk and, and Heckman wrote a paper on uh, on experiments, and they had these nice uh, quotes. Uh, uh, one uh, from the '85 edition of Samuels Samuels and the Nordhaus uh, Principles of Economics that economics unfortunately cannot perform the controlled experiments, the chemists and biologists, because they cannot easily control other important factors, like astronomers or meteorologists. They generally must be content largely to, to observe. And then seven years later, uh, uh, the new edition, <laughs> experimental economics is exciting, new, new, new development. So there you see there is something happened there that, uh, that uh, of, of a development uh, with, with regard to um, uh, experiments in the socioeconomic sciences. Now, uh, causal connections on the whole in our science run via the micro uh, uh, level and in order to get uh, a grip on these causal uh, connections, um, we need good micro foundations. Meaning, we need good theories for the micro level to uh, to get at these causal uh, relations. Now, uh, so this is basically the uh, the idea. Some people call this the Coleman uh, boat. But uh, uh, so we have uh, we 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 on the whole, have regularities at the meso and macro level, and then uh, we need good theories on the micro level. And we talked already, uh, some people already talked about that, uh, uh, for example, this step is still a very complicated uh, step, and it, uh, and it is. Uh, so much work still there has to be done. But what I contend is that the better the theory, the, the, the micro foundations, the easier it will be to actually also make the step back, step back up. So the claim is that for good micro foundations, we need experiments that are directed at theory development. Um, and that micro foundations without experimental work remain subject to non-causal criteria so that we have plausibility, tractability, simplicity, fit in tradition, or simply as if uh, uh, clauses. And I think much of microeconomics has been that way for a long time until the experiments, uh, experimental work really uh, kicked in. Uh, so uh, in, in, in economics and in sociology and, and in other uh, social sciences, experimental work uh, has greatly uh, increased. Experimental work directed at micro foundations at, at better theory f formation. Now, um, as far as I can see, we have three strands in the socioeconomic sciences that are directed at uh, uh, micro foundations, namely the anom anom anomalies and, um, and biases uh, strand, Kahneman, Tversky, uh, the, that kind of uh, uh, work. Uh, work that I would uh, just uh, uh, call social preference uh, work. Uh, that is uh, Ernst Fehr, uh, Gintis. That kind of, it's uh, it's a huge work, a very important uh, uh, work. And then we have uh, what I will mostly talk about today: the shifting saliences uh, 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 work. Uh, that is less done in uh, in in economics and more done in uh, in uh, social sci social psychology and in uh, in uh, s some parts of sociology the shifting salience uh, line is particularly important for why we need field experiments and i will come uh, come come back to that uh, later now uh, not all experiments of course are equally important for micro foundations we really need exp uh, experimental lines uh, that address the theoretical uh, questions and not just simply effects and i think this is a, a, a point that russell made this morning that we find 
in sociology a great deal of of experiments that show this effect or that effect rather than uh, a cu some cumulative results that improve uh, the micro foundations with which we can uh, work. So uh, uh, what I would like to uh, to do now in the in the following is is to to illustrate the important point about the theoretical progression uh, uh, of 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 these experiments with a series of experiments that we have done on shifting uh, sa uh, saliences, but of course we standing on the shoulders of uh, of, of giants. Uh, there is, first of all, a pioneer called uh, Robert Cialdini, uh, uh, known to many of you, uh, that um, uh, he did very important work on, uh, on, uh, on norms. And um, on the basis of uh, cognitive social psychology, uh, Cialdini and his co-workers worked out uh, the focus theory of uh, normative conduct, which I think has, is hugely important uh, um, for uh, the development of the shifting salience uh, branch. So basically, the, uh, Cialdini's idea was that uh, one will not follow social norms unless they are salient, so they are activated in one's mind. So we have all sorts of things in our mind, but only those parts that are activated at the moment will be really relevant for, for behavior. So that is against the traditional sociological idea of internalization as being the, the ground for, for acting on the basis of norms. So you can have internalized norms. If they are not activated, you will not act on it. So saliences shift with circumstances, especially with the observed or surmised behavior of others. And we will come, come to that. So here's just one example of uh, an, an experiment that uh, Cialdini uh, did. Here's a, a, a parking uh, a garage. A confederate uh, uh, had a, a, a large handbill and, uh, and uh, threw it on the, on the, on the ground. Now, the subjects were, this field experiment, were people who come to their cars. And uh, when they came to their cars, they saw that there was a large handbill uh, put under their windshield wiper so that they could not drive away without, without taking it away. And the question is, would they also simply throw it on the ground or, or take it with them to, to dispose of it uh, later, uh, later on? Now, there were uh, two predictions that uh, subjects who saw the Confederate li litter into a fully littered environment uh, would litter more than subjects who did not see that. And the second prediction was subjects who saw the Confederate litter in, into a clean environment would be less likely to litter than those who... So, it is not true that every little bit counts. That there was an economic uh, uh, word of that. That the first piece of litter works the other way around. Uh, so that was uh, Cialdini. So he could he could show that the first piece uh, was a significant uh, uh, drop. It activated the anti-litter norm, an injunctive uh, norm, because the contrast is it's clean, and you throw a thing like that uh, uh, down it activates the, uh, the cleanliness, the anti-litter norm, rather than uh, that you would imitate. But if there's already much litter, then seemingly the injunctive norm is not that, that important. Basically, the injunctive norm then is uh, pushed into a direction of a descriptive, uh, descriptive norm. OK, now here comes uh, the uh, progressive move uh, on that. The progressive move is also, again, based on uh, what uh, has been done in cognitive uh, social psychology on goals and mindsets, that uh, there are overarching goals in our mind that uh, contain entire classes of more concrete goals and preferences. And shifts in salience now concern mainly these overarching, these overarching uh, 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 goals. Uh, I don't have time now to uh, to actually uh, tell you where um, 
Now, uh, this idea about overarching goals uh, pat or particular overarching goals comes from there's a, basically quite a bit of influence from evolutionary anthropology uh, 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 in, in that not just uh, cognitive uh, uh, sociology or, uh, and psychology. But in any case, one of the overarching goals is to act appropriately. That is, uh, Russell uh, already talked about uh, uh, this putting yourself into the shoes of uh, others uh, that we find with the Scottish uh, moralists. Uh, and um, uh, that very ability seem to have evolved that we can put ourselves into the shoes of the, of the, of the entire group. And if we do that, then we act as a member of the, of the, the, the group. So uh, these are then uh, overarching goals. We have to, on the right uh, the normative goal that is where you act as a member of the group. A hedonic goal is a goal where you uh, concentrate on uh, feeling uh, better right now. It's, uh, this is a goal that is linked to uh, the um, uh, satisfaction of uh, fundamental needs. Uh, you're hungry right now, so uh, you want to eat this uh, a link between needs and goals is done via feeling the way you feel right now. Uh, and uh, then we have a gain goal that is quite different where you are oriented towards acquiring resources. So there's a longer time, time perspective. Uh, that's when you want to, uh, to invest for investment behavior would be typically uh, related to this uh, gain goal. Now, the idea is that the salience of these three can shift depending on, uh, on the circumstances uh, and, uh, again, very much depending on what other people are, are doing. So the normative goal can, can become dominant. We then call it a, a goal frame because it frames the rest. It's not just that your preferences shift endogenously. They do. But in addition to that, the way you... Uh, process inf information shifts as well. What you find important or not important, uh, what you ignore, what you like and dislike uh, will be very much affected by that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, these shifting salience effects are, are quite huge in terms of mental processing. So uh, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the situation, one of these three can be actually become the, the dominant uh, uh, one. And this leads to the fascinating possibility that changes in behavior are really heavily, heavily influenced by the changing salience uh, or activation uh, due to influences in the environment. This is actually a very sociological, so th think of the, the, the micro-macro thing, the micro-foundation thing, that the theory already has lots of openings for influences from, from, the, from the top level that way. It's not like many psychodynamic theories where all sorts of things. So many psychologists basically have behavioral theories that, that have to do what happens inside the person here. It happens in the, uh, in the environment. Now, um, uh, the salience of the normative goal is, as I said, uh, uh, affected by behavior of, uh, of others. So that is the theory. And so that observed respect for norms would increase the salience and observe disrespect would decrease it. Um, uh, of course, what uh, I cannot show, show to, uh, uh, today because I don't have time is that it's, uh, it really depends on who shows respect. If uh, people like, like you and me show respect, it will have this effect. If you have the Hell's Angels, uh, do it, uh, it will have the opposite effect, but I will not talk about that uh, to, today. Okay, so this now leads to a very important uh, 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 extra development, and that is cross-norm effect. So you see a d disrespect for norm A, which will change the salience of the normative goal and make you when it, uh, it makes that smaller, a disrespect norm B. So this is basically a cross-norm effect. It's not an imitation. 
It's not that uh, you observe somebody litter and you litter also. Um, Chad Chardini was busy with that, but uh, here this is this is now exactly the progressive shift: is that it works via an overarching goal, such that observing disrespect for one norm will create disrespect for another norm, and this can make disrespect of norms um, spread through a system. So think of the uh, broken window theory, of course, is, is one uh, one uh, one example of that. Uh, one example of that. So if there's a cue that others don't follow norm A, the observer is also less likely to uh, follow norm B. That's the theory. Is this true? Yes. Do norm A, B, and C belong to the same yeah. set? Of well, well, this is it's a very important question you ask, but I, uh, it's one that I cannot answer on the basis yet of our, of our research because we have not explored the full range of differences. That uh, but it, It's a very... Very important question. That, uh, what? By the way, what's the, uh, there's a, a mirror image of this, which is that showing respect for a norm, even a trivial one, may enhance yes. and make more salient the following and more important Yeah, which yeah. Which is, in my opinion, one of the functions of elaborate dinner tables things like that. Absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree, and I will show an experiment to that, to that effect uh, later on. So uh, now I will just show you a, a series of experiments. Some of you may 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 know them already that uh, that uh, we have done uh, that will now basically test uh, this uh, this idea, this uh, shifting salience idea. The first one is the mailbox or letterbox uh, experiment, where we had we we we, we took a mailbox and we had a. Uh, uh, a letter hangout with a window and there are the five five euros uh, that we put in there um, and um, uh, uh, we had two conditions one was the mailbox as it uh, as it was and in the other condition we sprayed it with uh, graffiti <coughs> as a, a deviation of one particular norm and then so the question was would that increase uh, that people who walk by steal actually that uh, that letter. they see there are five uh, euros in there would it increase uh, the likelihood of stealing that letter stealing is a very well in turn not to steal a very well internalized norm so uh, it, the question is would sa changing salience make a difference in the, in the observance of this uh, norm and we see with no graffiti it's 13 uh, percent who steal the uh, the letter and with graffiti it is uh, 26 27 uh, percent it's uh, doubled uh, it's uh, as far as effects go in the sort of sciences quite a sizable uh, 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 difference that the people who steal uh, uh, walkers by who steal is doubled just because there's uh, graffiti on it. now Progression, again, is it not just a fear of sanctions? That you say, okay, if there's graffiti, there's no police around, and I can uh, steal. Because uh, people who, uh, who would like to have a rational explanation for, for that, that is based on incentives, will always ask that question, of course. So what we did is we repeated that experiment with, in two ways. We, uh, we did one experiment where we, we put no graffiti, but we put garbage on the on the ground uh, because in Groningen you are not as opposed to Singapore you are not fined for throwing things on the ground there's no no uh, so if there's garbage on the ground it's not a sign that there's no police around uh, and then uh, we did another experiment with helping behavior which is also beyond sanctions if you if you uh, fail to uh, act pro-socially uh, you will not get uh, sanctions so with the graffiti we have Basically, the the same uh, the sorry with the um, garbage on the ground, we have the same same effect. Um, uh, uh, the, it, it it wasn't any uh, any smaller. And here we have the helping where we we uh, we introduced a variety of the letter uh, 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 experiment where we we put an, uh, an 
stamped and addressed letter uh, on the sidewalk, and there is the uh, the mailbox. Um, and um, what we what we did is that in one condition we put uh, garbage bags. I don't know whether you can see it. These are garbage bags. Uh, now in Groningen, uh, uh, that's you're not allowed to do that. Uh, uh, to put garbage bags, uh, th that's a clear uh, transgression. And uh, so these were the two conditions, uh, no garbage bags and the garbage bags. And the question was, people who walk by, how, what is the percentage of people who would pick up that letter and, and put it in the, in, the, in the mailbox? So there can be no question of fear of sanctions for, for, for doing that. And, uh, and then we see with the garbage bags, it's 10%. And without uh, garbage, uh, then it's 24 percent. So it's it's again a sizable uh, difference. So it is not sanctions that's, uh, that drives the uh, the things. Okay, now progression again. Uh, is there if there is a general goal to act appropriately, then it should not just hold for social norms. It should hold for legitimate rules as well. Legitimate rules so th that create. A feeling of uh, of obligation. So, we did a number of extra uh, experiments where we first uh, did one with the police ordinance, ordinance, then with simply a national law, and then finally even with a legitimate private rule. So let me briefly go through that. Um, so this is the police ordinance. Uh, here's a parking lot. What we did is we blocked off the parking lot with with construction fences. And we left an opening of, five, of 50 centimeters so that you could squeeze through sideways, not front, but sideways. And we put on two uh, police ordinances. Here it says no, no, uh, no uh, passing, and you have to go 200 meters around, which is quite a quite a. a different. And then it, another one because we always cross norm. We need two norms. The other one was that you are not allowed to lock bicycles to the to the fence. And so what we uh, then uh, did is in one condition, we had four bicycles standing close to the fence, but not locked to the fence. And in the other condition, we had bicycles locked to the fence in, in transgression of this. And the question was, how many people would squeeze through on their way to the car? And this effect surprised us in the, in the size, because it was with the non-attached bicycles, it was 27% who squeezed through, but with the bicycles uh, uh, being, it was 82. This is, this is a truly huge, huge difference. And the only thing we did is that we showed a sign of transgression of a legitimate police ordinance. All right. Now, a national law. In Holland, you are not allowed to uh, set off fireworks uh, before December 21st. That's the only time you can, uh, you can use fireworks. Uh, but of course, there are always people who uh, do it uh, earlier. So what we did is we had, there's a bicycle shed close to the station where, where people then get their bicycles. And we hung flyers on their bicycles such that they, uh, over the, the brake, that they couldn't really drive off without removing uh, this flyer. And the question is, did, would they just throw it on the ground or would they uh, uh, put it in their, uh, in their pocket? Throw it on the ground was uh, littering, that, so we interpreted that as, as, uh, um, the, uh, as, a, as a violation. And then uh, the national law is at the independent, uh, so there's, everybody knows this law in, uh, in uh, Holland. And what, what we did is two weeks before December 21st, we uh, did these experiments and we set off outside the shed, we set off firecrackers or not, uh, as people were. And the question is, if they heard firecrackers, deviation of a national law, would they litter more? Cross-norm effect. Answer is yes. So no fireworks, it was 52%, and with fireworks it was 80, and that was really a, a, quite a significant uh, 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 difference. So it worked with the national law. Finally, private rule. The, just a rule was saying return your shopping cart. 
in a parking garage of a large supermarket. It's a legitimate request uh, that the, the, the people really, if everybody would let it stand, uh, uh, people couldn't uh, move with their cars and so forth. So uh, we put flyers under the windshield wipers like uh, Cialdini did. And, uh, and then the question is, the people who came here, by the way, is the parking garage. The, so the question is, how many people would uh, litter the uh, flyer under the under the windshield wipers? And here you see these carts that we had standing there. So just, let me just add an anecdote of problems we had. People who were coming in would then just take these cars uh, for their own shopping. So. It, uh, but we had to leave them there for people who were leaving, not coming. So what we had to do, we took Vaseline and put it on the uh, on the handle. <laughs> but these are just the small things you have to do when you do field experiments. So, and do you uh, have to pay them $50 afterwards? Not, not in Holland, not in, maybe <laughs> here. Uh, uh, okay, so, all right. So, so then... Uh, then you see when shopping uh, carts uh, were were left uh, as uh, astray, um, uh, uh, were uh, not left astray. Uh, Thirty percent uh, of the people uh, littered uh, the what we put on the windshield wipers. But with the shopping carts, the way you see them here, it was fifty-eight uh, uh, percent, so almost uh, double again. It's sizable effects, really. So. There is clearly a cross-arm effect. It is not due to uh, to uh, sanctions, uh, and indeed it holds for legitimate rules as well as for norms. So this is the 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 progression. Now another progression then was uh, that uh, what Peyton just uh, uh, mentioned that if disrespect lowers salience of normative goal, then uh, the respect for norms should increase the salience, is, it should just work the other way around as well, if there is such a thing as a salience shift of an overarching one. And it should also work for cross norms, right? That's the, that's, so what do we do? We, 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 uh, we did uh, the, the following experiment. So here you see a house, then you see a, a lady, she works for us, and here's a bicycle. Uh, she stands between the building and uh, and her her bicycle, and she has a, a bag here which you c cannot uh, see. This filters out red for some reason, and it uh, um, if somebody walks by, then when when that person is about here, she accidentally drops oranges, and then the question is, would people help her pick up the the uh, the oranges? So that's. Uh, 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 pro-social norm of helping because she would have to put her bicycle on the stand, walk around the bicycle in order to pick them up. It's much easier if somebody just helps. It's just a few oranges. And the only difference we had now is that uh, you cannot quite see it, but back here there is a, a, a person who in front of his house is sweeping the sidewalk. He is He's, he's following a, a clearly a, a norm of, of getting rid of other people's garbage in, in front of his, uh, his house. So people who come by have seen this guy or have not seen this guy. That's the only difference. They have seen a guy sweep or not. Now here's, here is the difference. No sweeper, 40% help. A sweeper, it's 83. Again, these effects are very large. It, it, it's nothing than that you have just seen somebody act pro-socially that makes you much more likely to act pro-socially uh, as well. Now, the conclusion on the shifting salience effect is that uh, they have sizable effects. Uh, uh, but this also gives us a handle on uh, lab versus field experiments. Then the idea would be that conduct Field experiments, if you have reasons to believe, uh, if you have reasons to believe that the salience differs considerably in the artificial versus the uh, 
the, the, the lab. Uh, 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 of course, you may not know, and you have to uh, try it out, uh, but you may, not, you may know beforehand. Uh, here are, here's an example of an experiment by, by Stoop, uh, Nusser, and, uh, and Zust. Uh, uh, these are uh, our economists. A very nice experiment where they d did a dilemma game. This is now uh, a lab in the field experiment where they varied what is the lab in the field. Is the lab in the field the lab, or is the lab in the field the field? So. You, it's both fields. These are real hobby fishermen. They love angling, so they trout. Uh, and uh, what they did is, so in the in the lab, they had th this was a restaurant close to the lake. These people would fish. It was really in the field, but it was virtual fish. And so uh, they found that there was uh, the normal pattern: high cooperation at first, that would gradually decay. This is what you always find in these uh, social dilemma uh, games. In the, in the field itself, when the people were sitting in the boat and really going for their own fish, nobody cooperated, zero. And there was no change over time. Wasn't it the cooperating this moment? And, oh, and it was, uh, uh, if, 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 you would, if you would fish less, then the others would get more. That was, that was, the, that was the, the, the idea. The, quite the normal idea of, of these social uh, dilemma games with one difference that you were not part, it, you didn't get more, the others got more. So the idea is that, that there is a sizable difference in the hedonic salience uh, of what f fish means to you, that uh, virtual fish, uh, you, you know, uh, that's one thing. but. The real fish, uh, fishing for a fisherman, is quite something else to, to, to give that up. Uh, it's also what you have to show for when you are, uh, when you are uh, uh, done. So, uh, uh, the the lab version was really done in their environment. It was in a restaurant next to the lake, but it was virtual fish. And then, in in their real situation, sitting in the boat. It's, you, you can read the article. It's a really terribly nice article in, in, the, in the Journal of Political Economy, 2012. Uh, uh, so th this is, I think, very, very instructive of that we really always should consider these uh, salience uh, uh, effects. Now, uh, f there is further uh, pro progression that uh, we are also in the process of course, we do more field experiments, uh, for example, with regard to uh, the Hells Angels uh, effect, but uh, um, uh, we also try to use lab experiments to get more at the nitty gritty um, mechanism of these, of these uh, salience uh, shifts in terms of cognitive things. So they are in the process of, uh, of uh, publishing and we also see to what degree State and trait makes a difference. Uh, there are personality difference or, or not, and that, that kind. Okay, uh, let me summarize. Experiments are possible and necessary in, this, in the socioeconomic sciences. They are vital for improving microfoundations. And investigating shift in saliences experimentally has proven fruitful, and it begins to have, a, have per, uh, profound consequences for the micro foundations in the social economic sciences. Thank you for your attention. Um, I, I'm very glad that you actually talked about this um, because actually I do believe that field experiments are, are one of the most important things we can do moving forward. Um, the question I have for you is the following. Um, how would you approach the problem of this scaling up uh, in your case? Scaling up in, in general is uh, in field experiments, let's say you do a randomized controlled trial to see whether um, giving money to women in villages increases their wealth. Um, the question is, uh, if you make this a policy at the national level, would the outcome you get in terms of improved wealth um, 
sort of scale up from the micro experiment you did, or would you encounter a series of problems in terms of implementation, in terms of like um, economic equilibrium and so on? In this case, like the question is slightly yeah. different, but the point is like every experiment of this kind has to deal with this type of problems. How how do you? I, uh, this is a, a very important uh, uh, question, and I believe the real the real scaling up depends a, a great deal on the, these ideas being spread to administrators uh, that allow you to, to do uh, 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 randomized uh, 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 trials in their environment. So we, we did that with, uh, uh, for example, an intervention now in real organizations with, uh, with a training for, with the seven habits trained by Kobe, some of you may know it, it's the most popular training uh, that's supposed to make workers more efficient in their uh, work and we had great doubts about that. We got organizations to actually implement that with a randomized trial where the certain groups got trained first and then others uh, later and so and it, it's a long story, it's a very elaborate uh, uh, study and indeed we turned out we are right. This, uh, Trainings make 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 people less efficient for the organization, more efficient for themselves. Wow. So so it's it, yeah it's really true. It's uh, uh, but uh, then of course uh, Kovi uh, thought simply thought he ne there is no experiment. So it's the first experiment, just as we were basically the first experiment on the on the, um, the broken window uh, theory. This is the first experiment on Covey that, that we, or n nobody ever uh, did that. But but you have to find organizations that are willing to uh, to do it. And it, and I, I believe that the more is known about uh, uh, the importance of these uh, of these salient shifts because they are, it's again a salient shift that's happening through the intervention. Basically, interventions do that and. Uh, so the more is known, the more likely that uh, administrators can be talked into. <coughs> that we, we we used to have way back in the '60s uh, the uh, negative income tax uh, experiment, for example, and uh, and I think you mentioned uh, another tax. Well, who, who, who was it this morning who mentioned another tax or not? But but uh, we we need many more of these occasions to uh, do it. So we are trying now. Just to give you an example, we are trying to talk hospitals into allowing us to change uh, the cleanliness uh, conditions for doctors to see how, how that affects the way they uh, treat uh, patients. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a long story. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this might be a left field question, but hopefully not. But how do you conceptualize the role of history in this sort of event, the fact that this is Holland you're talking about. I mean, uh, like, you know, I, Phil Gorski, you know, is a sociologist at Yale, and wrote a book about the uh, development of the Holland, the Dutch state. I wrote a chapter in my book about the development of the Amsterdam stock market and so forth. And you, you go do those historical studies, and, you know, it always comes back to Dutch Catholic Church, and it's very, very large in the history of uh, integration between the Netherlands and Holland and so forth. And, you know, what Gorski uh, argued, which I basically agree with, as all of you could claim it, is that, you know, what was distinctive about the Dutch Calvinist Church as opposed to Catholicism or something, is that they have this, the consistories, they have this board of elders, you know, where people basically report on each other about their sort of behavior. It's not a boss system, hierarchical system, it's a sort of a lateral, a lateral control, sort of observational uh, sort of system. So, you know, if you have that as your knowledge of the history of the Netherlands, well then, you know, all these experiments, you know, are all about lateral sort of control and, and so forth. And so, obviously, you, you're showing a lot of variation. Dutch people don't all behave the same. So the role of history can't be homogenization. It's not that uh, everybody, they're all sort of programmed with their genes or something. But what is the role of all of this Dutch Calvinist lineage and so forth on these, uh, these micro behaviors, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the macro to the micro part, the first leg in Coleman's boat, you know, the, the down leg in Coleman's boat, you know, and, and uh, you know, one, I don't know what you would say to that, but I, I did, do remember your comment to uh, Russell, 
<coughs> the song, you know, paying fifty dollars over. This is home, you know. So there's there's something about um, not about people's psychology exactly, but people's expectations about what other people are doing, you know. And I would submit that there's probably a lot of this, a lot of cross cultural variation in historical what you expect other people to be doing. And maybe pushing a little against Peyton, you know, he, he pushed this uh, sociological stuff aside. But you know, it's not just a matter of looking at your contemporary, your contemporary uh, peers. It's also looking at your historical ancestors, you know, that are that are establishing some of these lineages. Something about Dutch identity, you know, which has a lot to do with Calvinism and so but, forth. Uh, uh, John, let, let me. But, uh, I, I, I. I take your point, but uh, I think uh, what, what may be particular about the, the, the Dutch is uh, will have to do more with the size of the effect than the direction of the effect. There is so, so much evidence, and now that I've done all these experiments, if I go through the end, uh, you will, uh, in, in a number of years, you will have a book, uh, I hope, at Princeton, where I write it all down. Uh, um, you find that so many people did experiments that you actually, when you in, in, interpret them, are exactly Syrian shifts uh, without them, them interpreting them. All the work of, of Ariely, I don't know who knows Ariely yeah. here, but uh, is, is basically Syrian shift, uh, but he doesn't, he is really one of those psychologists who doesn't care about theory, but, but if you then these Syrian shifts uh, things that are dependent on the behavior of others are, are found ev in everywhere. And then you have the, the work by, by, by Henrik and so on on, on, on very strange countries uh, uh, with regard to... Uh, uh, these Syrian shifts, uh, I think, uh, are not truly really not Calvinist or, or Dutch, but the size, the, the, the size, how easy it is to make the normative goal Salient. It just takes one. If I would do it in Harlem, uh, probably it may look. Uh, it would take more. Uh, to, to to do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so that would be my 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 take on that. History matters a great deal uh, with regard to that for the threshold effect uh, under which already uh, uh, things would would uh, would uh, shift, and that's, that's exactly why we would need. Uh, these field experiments in different places. Yes. What, what relation do you see between your salience shifts and and priming? No, uh, uh, salience and priming are salience shifts. Uh -huh. Priming is basically saying It's only that the priming literature so far, on the whole, has been restricted to the to the lab and has not been. That's again typical. That's that's the the, the point that Russell made. The priming literature has not related to a behavioral theory for the explanation of uh, macro phenomena. So they have not really uh, paid much attention on the systematization of the conditions. Let's say, do police ordinances work like social norms? You didn't have that. So the, the priming literature really uh, uh, looks at, at, the, at the effect of the of the local prime, not of the variation of the of the, the primes, and so yeah, it's the, it's these are all priming. Do you mind if we move on? We maybe circle back to questions at the end if we have time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.